and I'm on the science both in committee. And before we get to the introduction and, and today's talk, let me quickly go over uh, some announcements. We have, oops, I hope my point is the right way. <laughs> we have one more talk class, two weeks from today, 3.15. And this one will be, here comes the sign, and it will be done by a NASA ambassador who's gonna talk for us in the past two years back. So that could be a good talk. Okay, why is it not working now? There we go. Okay, Magasco Area Partners in Science. Uh, this coming Friday, we'll have a great speaker on the James Webb Space Telescope. And we'll be doing two presentations, 4 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Both talks are for all ages, and they'll be in Sierra Hall next door, room 132. Along with that, the Great Valley Museum will be doing two special showings of a new planetarium show called Mantum of the Universe. The first one will be at 515 right after the first talk, right after the 4 p.m. talk. The second one will be 615 before the 730 talk, like always a person. And that is true if you're an MJC student too. You'd be in free for students, but not the planetarium. And then, in addition, the museum has a couple more events coming up. Uh, hell, uh, before Halloween, this weekend, Saturday. And uh, so if you have children, grandchildren, bring them in, have them in their costumes. If you want to wear their costumes as much as they can, and they will get in free. So the lots of activities. The museum really decorates the place. And then... Oh. One more thing is a partnership between Matt and the museum again. Uh, the next talk for Matt, what could be wrong way? The next talk for Matt will be uh, let me, uh, November 18th. And again, two talks at, uh, will there just be one talk? Was no, there'll be two. There'll be two. Okay, this is incorrect then. There should be two again at 4 and 7.30. And in addition to that, the museum will be having some activity. Uh, and there'll be this art oh, contest nice. too. Uh, so there's that coming up. And then finally, Terry, you want to talk about this one? Sure. The Salmon Festival will once again be happening up at Knights Ferry at the Stanislaus River Park on November 12th, right 10 to 3, and it won't be quite as big as it has been in the past, but there's already quite a few exhibitors that will be there, and it's a family-friendly free event, so I encourage you to go. It's a beautiful time of year to be up at Knights Ferry. So, Denise, are you? Yeah, we need to get this off. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, let's get this off. I get her book program up. I think it's up. Yep. Okay, we're great. <laughs> I'm going to present it. Come on, Mouse. There you go. Okay. <laughs> well, before I introduce our speaker, I just want to also mention that there are a couple of flyers out from uh, around the room. Uh, one is for that. Maps event, March Ma our Monarch Madness on November 18th, and there's an art contest. And students of all ages are eligible to enter their artwork. And that deadline for that is coming up November 11th. So if you have, if you're inspired, please enter. Um, and then there are fly flyers out also for the Salmon Festival. So it is great to see you. Uh, my name is Terry Curtis. I am a professor emeritus here at MJC. I was in the biology department. And this young lady was one of my students as well as many others in the, in the room. Um, so it's great to have Emma Stein with us today. Uh, she was a biology student here at MJC. And many of us did have the pleasure of teaching her or, or advising her in club. She was very not only an excellent student, in all of her science courses, but she was a leader in our environmental club on campus, Operation Green. 
Um, of course, all of that was pre-COVID, so a different, different life. <laughs> um, so after completing her coursework here at MGC, Emma transferred to UC Santa Cruz, where she majored in marine ecology and earned her BS degree. And from there, she applied and she was accepted to a Master's of Science program at Bangor. And Emma, your degree was in marine biology. Yeah, so Bangor University in Wales. And so she just completed that this summer. So she's fresh. <laughs> she's fresh from that. And we're really excited to have her here today with us. And she'll be sharing her research that she just completed. So please welcome Emma Stein. Thank you, Terry, and thank you for having me here. This is pretty cool because I once was sat where you sat, taking notes for Etch to Credit. So as Terry said, I did go to MJC, and I really enjoyed my time here. It was super fun. And uh, after going to MJC, I transferred to UC Santa Cruz, there we go, where I worked on red rock crab prey choice with Dr. Mark Carr and his grad student, Casey Sherry with little purple urchins too, the prey. <laughs> and then I just finished my master's program at Bangor University with Dr. Martin Kerr, working on cancer pagaris crabs, which are a slightly different species, which we'll talk about in a moment. And throughout all of that, I also taught online through Athena's Advanced Academy with a variety of marine biology and ecology classes, and also taught in a variety of interesting locations. So today I'm going to talk to you about Cancer pagaris, which is a type of cancerid crab similar to the Dungeness crabs that we have around here, but different in that they're from the Atlantic and also a different species, but fairly similar. So they're about this size-ish, although they can be bigger than this and also smaller, obviously, but they are a pretty important species that we don't actually know a whole lot about. So my research is focused on figuring out their relationship with these three different prey species. So we have three different bivalves here, bivalve meaning two shells. So these are clams, mussels, and cockles. So the clam here is Scrobicularia plana, which has a relatively thin shell. Actually, I think I might pass these around. So here's a clam. Ooh, it has a thin shell. And then Middleus edulis is the blue mussel commonly, which is fairly similar to the California mussels that we have. Hey, look at you, you've been chosen. And they have around a medium shell thickness. And then we have a cockle here. This one's partially there. Here, we might as well just there. Um, and they have a thicker shell. We have a range of different shell thicknesses as well, which are different shape to the cockles, although the clams and the cockles, they have a relatively similar shape. So that allows us to look at the, how those morphologies are intersecting with the crabs and what the crabs are selecting and how they're able to eat them. So it opens up a lot of really interesting questions. So, oh, hang on. <laughs> so, Crab, the Cancer pagaris crab species is what we refer to as a generalist predator, which means that it can eat a variety of different things, including for sure, Middleus edulis and Cirrus dederma edule. We haven't known about Scorbicularia plana yet, but they're found in the same areas as the cockles. So they're definitely a potential prey species. So when we're thinking about generalist predators, predators that can eat a wide variety of things, in California, we think of the otters because the otters eat a lot of different things, including some cancered crabs, which look very similar to ones that I've worked on. So an otter technically could eat a huge variety of foods, but really each individual otter is only eating one or two, maybe three different things. And that preference is passed down maternally. Similarly, humans, 
we have a huge variety of foods that we could potentially eat, but we don't really eat every single thing every single even year. There's a variety of foods I've never even tried, and I'm sure you probably haven't tried every single food in the world either. So what are the crabs doing? The crabs are either all eating all three of these species, so that would be a generalist, generalist individual, or potentially each individual crab is eating only one type of these bivalves. So you could have a crab that's only eating a clam, only eating mussels, only eating cockles day in, day out, or you could have some combination of that. That would be some form of specialism. Or you could have a, a population that's made up of both generalist and specialist individuals. So that's part of what I'm trying to figure out here or what I tried to figure out. I guess I succeeded, at least in this population. So why did I choose this species? Great question. First, we don't know very much about their diet, which is kind of surprising. We actually don't know a whole lot about the diets of a lot of different organisms, which is strange because at a certain point you think that we know a lot, but in a lot of ways, we don't know a lot about what different things are actually eating. There are very few studies done on these crabs and what they're eating. However, they're super commercially important to the point that 25,000 tons were landed in the UK in 2021, which was worth nearly 62 million pounds. So this is a really important species that we don't actually know a lot about ecologically. Now, in terms of a general, a general approach to what I'm trying to do here, a arthropod species is actually really helpful. And that's because the morphology of their claws or how big their claws are is a constant between their molting events. So if you're an arthropod, you have this exoskeleton on you. It's like a suit of armor. You can't grow past that suit of armor. You have to molt it and grow a new one. So between those events, you can't really change your morphology, which is really helpful for me because that means that I can study these crabs with a constant morphology, at least until they start molting on me. So my hypotheses, which were scientific guesses, were as follows. This is not necessarily what I found, but this, these were my guesses. So my hypotheses were that individual crabs possess prey preferences, so they have a preference for a specific bivalve. And those prey preferences are linked to the predator's morphology, especially how thick their claws are. So the thickness of their claws relates to how powerful their claws are and so how they can how easily they can eat things the shell shell thickness and the shape of prey so those different shells have different thicknesses different shapes and that will influence potentially how well those crabs can actually eat those prey items and then also the energetic value of prey which i'll talk a little bit more about later especially but for now it's how much energy that predator gains by eating that prey organism. So in order to do this, I acquired some crabs and I put them in tanks. So each individual tank is an individual crab. And I had another bench of those as well. So there were 15 crabs in total, uh, 13 of which ended up being viable for study because some of them lost some claws along the way. and. 12 of which actually ended up eating during my study period. Science is full of crabs and organisms just not doing what you want them to do, but that's okay. So each crab was in their own individual tank. So this is crab 13 with a mussel that he looks kind of interested in, but he wasn't interested in it. And for quite some time at that, what I would do is every day I put the prey around here. I would feed them at five p.m., leave, come back at nine, and see what they had eaten the night before. That was not the original plan. The original plan was for me to actually observe them eating their food. But that didn't quite work out because they refused to eat in front of me. So that's another good lesson in science, is that you would want to have a backup plan for what you're going to do. So it didn't work out, but flexibility helped, and I was able to at least do something with them in which they were eating. So first up, prey preference. Along the way also, I'll be showing you some pictures of crabs doing not quite what I want. This is crab nine who was really good at getting out. Really good. Boop. All right, 
So first, we're going to start with a graph. Before we actually get to the graph, I'm going to explain what the graph means. So this is a box plot. So the X is the mean, so that's the average. The line in the middle is the median, so the exact middle of the data. In this case, they're pretty well aligned. There will be some that they're not super aligned later. The box is the interquartile ranges. That's basically an inner range of the data, so the middle part of the data. And then the furthest bars are the full range of data. So really, this is just showing you what the bell graphs-ish look like on a XY axis, where they're all together in a way that's easier to compare. So what does this mean? Great question. So on the Y axis, we have the count of consumed bivalves. So this is a daily thing. So every day we had a certain number of clams eaten, a certain number of mussels, and a certain number of cockles eaten. However, we have some differences here. The clams and the cockles were eaten at a relatively similar pace. That's why they both have A's at the top. So they were similar statistically. Whereas the mussels have a B, they were not similar statistically to the clams and the cockles. As you can see, mussels were eaten far less than the clams and the cockles. So that's interesting and will be important later. So seven out of 12 crabs showed a preference for clams and cockles. Clams and cockles were the ones that were most uh, consumed. None of the crabs showed a preference for mussels, but five out of 12 crabs showed no prey preference where they ate clams, mussels, and cockles pretty much every day. They would eat all of the things at pretty much every day and they showed no preference for a specific group. So to sort of parse that out a little bit, this is a fancy thing called a C index. A C index is something that we use to show how what kind of selection we're seeing for these different prey groups. So at the bottom, we have the C index sort of number line. We have negative selection is a negative one. Positive selection is a positive one. That's the strongest positive and negative selection you can have. And then a zero is neutral. So if we go to the y-axis, we have negative 0.4 and 0.7. That's just how it worked out. And zero around here. So we can see that clams generally had positive selection. So they were generally being positively selected for as far as this interpretation goes. So clams were the best for, for selection. Whereas mussels and cockles, cockles were kind of stretching into that positive zone, but were mainly being negatively selected for. So they weren't being sought out in terms of this statistical analysis. And the mussels were practically always negatively selected for. So they were not really the thing that the crabs were going for, which again is interesting and will come into play more later. Um, and also, Clams are group A, mussels are group B, cockles span between both of those groups. So they weren't different from either the clams or the mussels, they're kind of just the in-between. So the previous graph was a lot better to start with because this one got a little bit weird, but that's okay. So additionally, I measured the claw size of all of the crabs. So I took the height, the length and the depth, which required a lot of crab wrestling and added those all together. And we have adjusted by CW here, which means carapace width. So across the carapace, that's the carapace width. Basically all that's for is to say, okay, we've taken the claw size and then we've adjusted it by the general size of the crab. So we can say, okay, that's just the claw size. What's interesting is that we have over here, we have males and females. Males are up here mostly, and then females are down here. Female crabs had smaller on average claws than the male crabs, just generally speaking, even when we've adjusted by carapace width. Also these two down here, that's a crab that molted. And so it's in gray and it was regrowing a left claw and that was a little bit of an outlier. But the main story is that the male crabs are, they have larger claws than the females. And that will also come into play later. I'm saying that a lot, but it will. Okay, so 
Next, we have ethogram analysis, which I will explain in a second. But there is something wrong in this picture. It's right there. That's a crab. It got out. Uh, that was crab four. This is also crab four. <laughs> crab four did not survive his third escape attempt. Um, but he survived that one. That was his first. OK, so what an ethogram is, is basically we're taking the qualitative, the observation of what we're seeing, what behavior we're seeing, and we're making it into something that we can better analyze. So I took the shell fragments that I got every time I went to go see what the crabs had eaten the night before, and I put them into four groups. So the first is pretty obvious, and that's that they've been crushed. So this cockle has been pretty much completely crushed up. You've got some medium, smallish pieces like this, which you can't even pretty much see because it's so small. So that is crushed. In a pride situation, we have the two valves relatively intact, not perfectly intact. A lot of the times there's be, there'll be a little gap in the middle where the crab made an opening to pry it open. Up here, which is interesting, this is something that was muscle exclusive. This is a pile of barnacles. So the muscles still had their barnacles on them. Sometimes what the crabs would do is they would somehow take the barnacles off. They wouldn't eat the barnacles. Those barnacles are just intact. They're not alive because they've been forcibly removed from their home, but they were pried off. In this case, not all the way, but sometimes completely devoid of muscles once I got to them. Sometimes the muscle would be eaten. Sometimes the muscle would be just intact. I don't know what's happening there, but it's interesting. So crushed pride. We have a combination of those two, which is crush pride, where we have one valve that's pretty intact, and then the other valve is just pretty much completely crushed. I don't exactly know how we got to this point because I didn't observe them eating it, but we know that that's what happened in the end. And then the most mysterious one, which is whole crush, where we have one valve that's been crushed and one that has a hole in it, like the one that was sent around, which I think is actually the same shell. I'm not sure what, ha what happened here. <laughs> there are reports of other crab species doing this with like a walking leg, like making a hole in the shell with a walking leg, but never to my knowledge of this crab species. So I don't know what happened, but it's cool. So that was a very rare thing to have happen. That happened with cockles and one clam. Um, crushed and pride and crushed pride were far more common than that. But it's going to depend on the species, as you'll see in this graph, which looks like a lot, but it's not. So we'll start with the clams. OK, so clams are in this group. Clams were pretty much always crushed. There were very few instances where they were not. The, I mean, it makes sense, because if you have just like this really thin shell, even a human can just pinch that between their uh, fingers and it would be crushed, which I have done accidentally a couple of times. So that's, I mean, you can't even really pry that open at that point. You've just touched it basically if, if you're a crab and it's broken open. So clams were pretty much always crushed. Also cockles, okay, we won't get to that yet. <laughs> Over here is the cockle section. So cockles were also most usually crushed, but there were a couple instances where they were crush pride. So most of the time crushed, a couple of crush pride, but usually crushed. Muscles were a little bit different though. The muscle body shape is not really conducive to crushing. You can't really fit it in a claw and then crush it. So they had to use a different approach, at least most of the time. So muscles were typically either pride, which is here, or crush pride. They were pride about 60% of the time, and then crush pride around 35% of the time. So not a situation where you're really able to crush that prey. You have to physically force it open. So now we go to the energetic value of prey with an adorable little crab that is so polite and is so nice at staying in its tank. So what I did for this, as I basically baked some bivalves and it smelled kind of like food, but it 
sure didn't when you put it up close to your nose. So what I did was I wrapped all of these bivalves, I did 30 of them each in tin foil, and I put them in a super hot furnace for a while until they were completely burned out. And then I did some fancy math, which was basically just subtraction. And I figured out the amount of those bivalves that was actually consumable compared to the amount of those bivalve weight that was just their shells. So taking that information, we have this graph. Basically what I did is called ash-free biomass, which is the amount of biomass that you have that is consumable, some sort of energy. So interestingly, the clams ended up pretty much negative in ash-free biomass, which doesn't seem like it would be possible until you remember that clams are super duper thin and very light. And it was probably the fault of the balance because the balance only had three decimal places and that would not really be enough to capture what I needed to capture here. So the clams just had so much of a negligible amount of nutrition inside of them that it just really wasn't picked up. So kind of like a candy sort of situation where they're really easy to open and it doesn't really give you a whole lot in return. The mussels, they had this huge range of ashery biomass values where sometimes you would get like one-ish gram, sometimes you'd get like 13 grams. So that's a huge range. And if you're trying to pry open a muscle, and that's taking a lot of energy, if you're crushing something, that's taking a lot less energy than having to pry it open. You don't really know necessarily how much actual nutritional gain you're going to get from that. So that could even be a net loss for you in the end if you end up getting a muscle with only a gram of ash free biomass. So it's a bit of a gamble. Uh, and the amount of ash-free biomass, the amount of nutritional gain in a muscle is going to depend a lot on the muscle's environment. So where the muscle is, how much food it has access to, how much crowding is in that muscle bed, things like that. So pretty broad range there. Cockles, pretty solid bet. It's not a lot of nutritional gain, as not as much as this specific muscle over here, but it's better than a clam. They're harder to open than a clam, but it's a pretty solid choice. So we have clam energetic gain, which is minimal, if that. Muscle energetic gain, which is really broad, and then cockles are pretty steady, although low. So what do we mean by all of this? Great question. Um, clams, easy prey, kind of covered this already. Easy prey, you can crush them super easy to gain access to, very little nutritional gain though, so candy. But it could be a safe choice for reducing potential damage to those claws because they're so easy to open that you aren't really risking a whole lot. Crabs can have mechanical damage to their claws where you're, in, if you're constantly crushing really hard things, that's gonna do a lot of wear and tear on your claws. And until you molt again, you're not really gonna have an opportunity to repair that. So the clams might be a good choice for trying to make sure that that doesn't happen. And in some cases, there have been studies that have found a, pr a preference toward smaller organisms. So choosing the prey that is the smallest, but there have also been studies that have seen crabs choosing the prey that is the largest. So the hypothesis for the smallest prey being chosen is basically that for reducing potential mechanical damage. In this case, the clams were the smallest prey, so that might go along with that hypothesis. The mussels, we're very difficult. You have to pry them open. That's really hard to do. I mean, it's hard. If, you've, if you haven't tried, you don't have to because you can just tell. It's really difficult. But there's a wide range of potential nutritional gain, which could be good if you have a 14 gram muscle, but could be really bad if you have a one gram muscle. So it's a gamble. And those factors combined into them being the least selected prey. They uh, apparently, a lot of crabs were either not willing to take that gamble or were somehow able to sense that those muscles didn't have a lot of gain for them. 
So unfortunately, <laughs> you can't really figure out which one of those two it was. Um, but some species have been shown to be able to tell which muscles are the most nutritionally um, dense. And so it could be that they're actually figuring out exactly which muscles are the best and avoiding the ones that aren't. Cockles were kind of in the middle. They were a moderately difficult prey to gain access to. They were, again, usually crushed, but sometimes they were crushed pride. There we go. Uniform energy gain. So not a huge gamble, but not a potential loss. And male crabs were favoring cockles more than females. Oh, that's something I haven't gotten to yet. So if we recall, male crabs had larger claws, right? So the larger claws are a proxy for the strength of the claws. So a stronger claw, logically, is going to be able to break through something that is thicker than a smaller claw can. So uh, conveniently, <laughs> male crabs tended to favor cockles more than female crabs did, which potentially means that the male crabs were more easily able to consume those cockles, to crack them open and eat them compared to the females, which potentially don't have as great of an ability to do that just because of how um, their claw size, how large their claws are. There we go. Okay, so we return to our hypotheses, this time with information. So, do individual crabs possess prey preferences? Yes, in some cases. So I found that we had about half of them, seven out of 12, had some sort of prey preference, and about five out of 12 of them did not, specifically five out of 12 of them did not. So this is something that has been shown in other species before, where we have some individuals being those specialist individuals specializing in a particular group and some being generalist predators. So this isn't something new, but it's nice to have that sort of confirmation where we're saying, okay, in some cases we have specialism and in some cases we don't. And, okay, well, that was supposed to come up slower, but that's okay. So prey preferences, are linked to the morphology, but not as much as I expected it might be. So the male crabs, their larger claws potentially led to them eating cockles more often, but the rest of their morpho morphological characteristics weren't really linked to and too much of anything to do with prey preference, which is interesting because you might assume that a larger crab might be selecting muscles more often or something like that. So that's an area where it will be interesting to see more work done on that because there might be something that we just missed and we didn't measure. So shell thickness and shape of prey, yes. The muscles were chosen less often. They're harder to gain, um, to actually open up compared to the muscles and not, not the muscles, the clams and the cockles. Muscles are harder and additionally, they're a gamble and the clams and the cockles are a much better bet. So what does this inform? Or as my grandfather very eloquently put it, what does it matter? So <laughs> great question. First of all, we can learn more about generalist versus specialist individuals. We do know some about it, but we don't know a ton about it, right? So this is still an area where we're not 100% certain what's happening with individual populations, except for otters. We're pretty aware of that. And that, of course, will lead to more ecological understanding because there are a lot of different questions about these systems. We don't know a lot about the food web dynamics of kelp forests, even though you might think that we would at this point, we don't. Similarly, we don't know a lot about the dynamics of the areas where these crabs live, which is harder substrate um, bottomed areas. So we don't know a whole lot about that, which is a bit of an issue for us if we want to inform industry because not only do we have the Cancer Figueres fishing industry, but we also have a lot of bivalve fisheries in whales. And that means that if we don't know what the predators are eating, which bivalves they're targeting, we can't manage those industries as efficiently. 
So having a better idea of what these crabs are going for can help us figure out how the mussels um, are farmed <laughs> and whether we need to be keeping the crabs away from the mussels, which in this case, apparently we don't really. We would be more apt to potentially keep them away from cockle digging, which is something that also happens. Um, people will go out and rake for cockles in the inner tidal. So if that is something where the cockles are suffering, now we know they're eating them. And also probably some other things are happening. And of course, Cancer figaris being a really important species for industry, knowing more about what they're doing out there is pretty important for protecting their stocks as well. Potentially most importantly though, we have rain shifts. So as our climate is changing and the water temperature is changing, we have species shifting northward. And we've already seen this in the Atlantic and in the Pacific. We've seen species shifting northward. So as that's happening, there's sort of a, a desire to say, well, it's okay because the generalist predators are there, so they'll just take care of it for us. But they may or may not actually do that depending on which individuals are in that population, what they're eating, and how all of that is interplaying with those rain shifts. So it depends. In this case, there, it's not really exactly clear whether if some new species moved into where Cancer pigaris tends to live, whether they would be the one controlling that population. And this, the same can be said for invasive species too. If there's an invasive species that we think that a generalist predator might consume, we don't really know if those individuals are actually going to be consuming them. But since there's a mix of generalist and specialist individuals, potentially. I mean, some of them were eating them all every single day. So there's a chance that we could depend on some members of the population, just maybe not all of them. So I will inform you that the crabs were successfully released. They didn't go anywhere, really. Um, they just kind of stayed there except for one of them, but they were released. Um, and there is Manai Bridge, which is the bridge between whales and then Anglesey, which is where I tended to be. So they are in their title, so I'm sure they're fine. <laughs> so if you would like to see some very cool 360 video content, Crab 10 actually did eat for me, but only after the experiment ended, because of course, why would, why would she possibly eat during the experiment? But she did actually eat for me. So you can see 360 video footage of that where you can drag it around and see where she is. It's pretty fun. And then also she continued to eat for me afterward, which is so kind for her to wait until then. Okay, so I have acknowledgments here. Thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. So what happened to uh, Crab 4? How did he end up like that? Great question. Okay, so Crab 4, Crab 4 escaped once, right? And he was totally fine. Crab 4 then escaped a second time and he was totally fine. And then Crab 4 made the mistake of escaping a third time. And that was when he popped his digestive gland. So there's like, there's a little digestive gland within the crab and it has digestive enzymes. It's kind of, if you look inside, it's kind of tinted yellow a little bit. That's the digestive enzymes. So he basically digested himself, which was his fault. It was not my fault. He knew how this worked. I put, he moved a lid with four bricks on top of it, four actual bricks. He moved that off and then climbed out onto the ground. And that was his fate, his self-imposed fate. Great question. Aren't you glad you asked that? <laughs> the good news is that there were other crabs um, and these are all from Wales. I took these all on an airplane and brought them back and only one person asked me a question about it. So, you know, worked out well for me. And they, they put it through the scanner and everything. So I'm guessing they just knew that they weren't alive. But I have molts of those as well. So those are totally fine. So they just molted, even though I didn't really want them to. And so they were totally fine afterward. Just Crab 4 wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering how big does the agoras have to grow up to before it can eat this hard prey? Or do they... Uh, if they're eating the cockles, they get them 
when they're young, when they are young, then they get bigger cockles when they get bigger. Or how's that going? That's a great question. So that's something that I don't really know quite yet because most of the crabs were around that same size. And so we didn't have apparently enough of a range to figure out when predation can start happening there because they were all able to eat them. So we don't really know at what point they're able to do that, presumably before they're this size. But that is a really good question. <laughs> and one that I hope to have some sort of answer to at some point, because it is fascinating. Yeah. Yes. So how long is this experiment last? I mean, now you get it from something mold kit, I assume, mm -hmm. right? So do they kind of mold all about the same time or? That is a very good question. OK, so. This experiment ran between some point in June through July. It was 31 days straight. So the entire, it was basically a month block spanning in between months. So I didn't really intend for them to molt. I intended for them to stay, the, they had the same morphology the entire time. But that didn't work because apparently I coincided with the, the mating season. In order to mate, the female crabs have to molt. Not all crabs need to do that, but Cancer pigaris does. So only some of the female crabs molted during the experiment. None of the male crabs did. So it was 31 days that just happened to be during when some of them were molting. Yeah, good question. <laughs> No, I just have a general question. Uh -huh. So how is the population of cancer figures doing in the wild? That's a good question. We don't know a whole lot about their population in general. So I'm quite sure that they are listed as either data poor or data deficient somewhere in the fisheries reporting. So in general, we just don't know a whole lot about what they're doing. We do know how many we caught. So hopefully more than what we caught are exist out there, but we do get, we got them from commercial fishing, fisher people. So presumably there's still more there. So yeah. follow up question, uh, mm -hmm. uh, were you able to look at statistics on the commercial fishery to see if there have been consistent numbers over the years? Mm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, I don't remember what those graphs looked like. There are graphs that exist. The number that I had, you had to pull from a very specific area, but there are graphs out there. I think that it has gone up, but I wouldn't quote me on that. But they do exist, I think. <laughs> Emma, I'm wondering, just this is just off topic a little mm -hmm. bit, but where are the fish, who are they selling? these crabs too. Me, they sold me 15, but. <laughs> 15. but yep. <laughs> normally the fishery, who are they selling them to? That is a good question. I, a lot of restaurants will have those. It's kind of it's kind of like our Dungeness. So in, in, in Wales, you'll yeah. see crab on the menu. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. from, it's that species. Yeah. Because in Scotland, you mm -hmm. don't see on the menu. Yeah, no. Crab, lobster. Not even like the. I know it's here, and I don't understand why we don't need it. Well, <laughs> it is there. It yeah, is it's there. there. Yeah. It's around. Yeah. And it's in the minch. And I know it's there, and I know it's being fished. But. Yeah. So it's interesting. So the Welsh mm -hmm. are partaking. In as crab. far as I'm aware, I don't eat any, but I'm pretty sure I've seen them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it's basically like our Dungeness. You know how Dungeness are the thing here? Yeah. It's basically the same thing over there except with cancer pagaris. Yeah, it's the crab. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is, I mean, off topic again, two more of a personal question or two actually. One is why Bangor, why do you go way old? And two, what's your plan next? Well, I went to Bangor for a couple of different reasons. One is it was COVID time and I wanted to do some research and I wanted to have a research project in sort of a more contained space because I'm still continuing to work on my research project at Santa Cruz, but it's more of a long form sort of situation. I wanted to have something where 
it, ha it had a time frame. And specifically, Bangor has a really good marine biology program, not to like plug it or anything, but it's a really good program where they have a really broad range of what they talk to you about. So we did all sorts of different uh, assignments about fisheries, aquaculture, um, the we did a whole habitat survey, so a really broad range of knowledge and skills, which I thought was really important at this point in my career. And then next, I am applying to PhD programs, and I'm continuing to teach, and that's kind of what's happening right now. <laughs> yeah. Come on, extra credit people. <laughs> you took notes. Yes. I hate to show my ignorance, but where is Bangor or Bangor? <laughs> That's a good question. I should have a map, but okay, if you kind of know Wales, it's at the tip. So in if you go onto a map of Wales, there's going to be like a little island at the sort of western tip. Bangor is right there. And then that's the island of Anglesey, which is where the lab is. Yeah. And do they say Bangor or Bangor? I kind of have picked up Bangor. I, I think that's how they say it. I've start, I started out saying Bangor, but then no one else said that. And so just slowly, my language has morphed into Bangor. Yeah. That's, I don't know. I think there's a Bangor in Northeast Europe. Yeah, in Maine. It's and very confusing. They have a saying, when I hear Bangor, I feel anger. <laughs> <laughs> they want to be called that. <laughs> well, I guess maybe that's why they differentiate. I don't know. But yeah, it's very confusing because if you look at if you look it up, you will get half results for Wales and half for Maine. It's very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give them another round of I should have my email on here, um, but it's kelp is on its way at gmail.com. If you, if you would like my business card, I have one so I can give it to you. But if you have any questions or anything, um, including Modesto Junior College questions, because I was here, I don't know what, what help I could give you, but you know, if you want. <laughs> yeah, I've been here. Yeah, if you have my shells, can you give them back? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the show.